come on in, find a seat, don't be shy, he said, as students filtered into the classroom. I promised there would be no major explosions or dismemberments, at least not on the first day, he flashed a, nasty, a naughty grin. Chris didn't know everything he would be learning in the class, but he already knew one thing. He had never met a teacher like Mr. Little. All right, let's go ahead and get started, Mr. Little said, though the tittering among the students didn't die down. Chris expected Mr. Little to raise his voice, take out his roll book, and start taking attendance, but instead he poured some kind of clear solution into a glass container he held over a Bunsen burner. Within seconds, a huge fireball appeared, its flames falling just short of licking the ceiling, then disappeared instantaneously. Everybody in the classroom gasped. I thought that would get your attention, Mr. Little said, grinning. But I promise, you ain't seen nothing yet. He looked around the room. This is science, and this is not for the faint of the heart or the cowardly. It's not about just reading a textbook and answering questions correctly. It's about innovative thinking. It's about getting your hands dirty. It's about experimenting with all that the world experiment implies. Sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail, but either way we learn. In this class, I may ask you to do some stuff that sounds kind of crazy, but I promise that if you bear with me and follow my advice, by the time you're done with this course, you'll be thinking, talking, walking, and quacking like a scientist. He looked around the room. Now who's ready to learn some cool stuff? Everybody clapped, hooted, or cheered. Chris already felt like he was a member of an exclusive club. Now before we get to the fun stuff, we have to jump through a few bureaucratic hoops. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Little said. The first being this lab safety contract, which you and your parents must read and sign, saying that you will not intentionally blow up the school or any other classmate. Oh, where's the fun in that? A kid in the front row asked and everybody laughed. Oh, it's always good fun until you have to scrub somebody's viscera off the walls, Mr. Little said. I do hate it when students leave a mess. More laughter. The boy sitting in front of Chris raised his hand and asked, are you going to talk about the lock-in? Yes, Mr. Little said. There will be a meeting in this room right after school today for everybody who's interested in coming to the lock-ins this weekend. I strongly suggest that you all come for the sake of your grades. Uh, he mouthed the words extra credit. And for the sake of science. Uh, once class was dismissed, the boy, in the, front of, uh, the boy in front of Chris turned around. I haven't seen you around before. Are you a freshman? His, eye, his brown eyes were intense and intelligent. Yes, Chris said. How about you? Sophomore, he, the boy said. Sanjeet Patel. Everybody calls me San. Chris Watson. San radiated not only intelligence but confidence. Chris suddenly, desperately, wanted this kid to like him. Are you doing science club? Stan, uh, San asked as they gathered their belongings. Sure. It's practically all I've thought about since I knew I was coming to West Valley. San smiled. Once you're in... It'll still be all you think about. Do you have lunch next period? Chris nodded, hoping for a lunch invitation. This conversation seemed to be going well. So do I and a lot of science club people. Why don't you sit with us and let everybody get a look at you and see what they think? That'd be great, thanks. Chris was happy to be included, even if it was seemingly on a trial basis. In the cafeteria, he sat with San and two other kids, a tall, lanky, red-haired boy who introduced himself as Malcolm and Brooke, a petite, black girl with springy dark curls. <coughs> Cassidy? Uh, wait, Malcolm. No, I, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Um, just ignore what I'm saying, everything I'm saying. Uh, Chris is in Mr. Little's third period class with me, San explained by way of introduction as they settled down to eat their lunches. Chris was the only one of them eating the lunch the cafeteria provided. The others had all packed lunches with fresh fruit and raw, and raw vegetables and sandwiches on whole wheat bread. Chris made a mental note to tell his mum that he wanted to start bringing his lunch. He would also have to be specific about what kinds of foods he'd to, back and pie, to buy and pack. He couldn't let these kids see him eating peanut butter and jelly on soggy white bread. Well, you must be reasonably intelligent then, Malcolm said, looking Chris over. Mr. Little only lets a handful of freshmen into his level two classes. Brooke smiled. Yeah, the freshmen who don't make the cut have to take Mrs. Har Mrs. Harris's earth science class. I know, right? Chris said. Josh and Kyle were in Mrs. Harris's class. Oh, come on, guys. They do lots of really ex challenging experiments, Malcolm said, like mixing vinegar and baking soda to make a volcano. His voice dripped with sarcasm. You're terrible, Brooke said. But 
They all laughed. They also collect four leaves and glue them to construction paper, Malcolm added. Though it's too hard an assignment for most of them, Chris laughed some more along with his, he hoped, soon to be friends. Stan, uh, I keep calling him Stan. <laughs> Stan could hardly contain himself. And their final exam, he said, laughing so hard he almost couldn't speak, is to try to find the school cafeteria. Many fail, of course, Malcolm said, snickering. Chris couldn't remember the last time he had laughed so hard. Of course, he felt a little bad because when he laughed about the stupidity of Mrs. Harris's students, he was also laughing at Josh and Kyle, who had been his friends since he was old enough to walk and talk. But he knew if he was going to reach his goals, he couldn't be sentimental. It was time to move up to a better class of friends. As soon as the dismissal bell rang, uh, Chris hurried to Mr. Little's classroom. He couldn't wait to hear about the lock-in. Other students must have felt the same way because when he got there, the room was nearly full and a buzz with chatter. He found an empty seat near San. I wonder what Mr. Little has cooked up this year, San had said to Chris. Chris smiled. I don't know. I hope it's cool. Oh, it will be, San answered, as though Chris's statement implied some kind of doubt in Mr. Little's abilities. Until you've experienced it, you can't possibly understand. It'll be life-changing. Chris nodded. He guessed he didn't understand, but he was looking forward to learning, and a life-changing experience was exactly what he needed. <clears throat> hey, San said. Malcolm and Brooke and I have a study group that means that meets at Cool Beans Coffee on Wednesdays after school. You should come. Are you sure? Are Malcolm and Brooke okay with it? Chris asked. He didn't want to appear pushy, like he was trying to force his way into their friend group. Yeah, they suggested it, San said. They like you. Chris smiled. He could feel his life changing already. The room fell silent when Mr. Little entered. He walked down an aisle of the classroom like a celebrity walking the red carpet. When he stopped and stood before them, he said, Greetings, my sweet little guinea pigs. Are you ready to hear what kind of experience I have planned for this weekend? The students clapped and hooted. Chris wasn't used to seeing such displays of enthusiasm in a classroom. It was a refreshing change. First of all, Mr. Little said, starting to pace, science requires sacrifice. If you're not willing to make a sacrifice to give up a part of yourself for the sake of science, then don't bother coming in on Friday, because this lock-in isn't for you. Stay home and do whatever it is you do on your little electronic devices or go play a sport or whatever. Only come here if you are willing to make a sacrifice and experience a transformation. Transformation. Chris felt like that was the word he had been looking for to describe what he was seeking. He wanted to transform his life, to transform himself into something different, better, more worthy. <clears throat> That's foreshadowing. <laughs> I bet you... People are going crazy about this story because it, <clears throat> quote unquote, um, what was I going to say? I don't know. <laughs> oh, confirms. It confirms, uh, you know, Mike bot. Uh, no, sorry, victim bot. Or is that even a theory? I don't even know. The fact that crying child comes back as a robot or something. It, that was basically my victim. Um, but I, I've... <laughs> I, I hope that's not where it goes. I hope that's not where the story is going. In the past, some of our science club lock-ins have been group activities. This activity is one you will do alone. In fact, each of you will have a cubicle sequestering you from the other students from and from me as well. Each of you will be issued your own Freddy Fazbear Mad Scientist kit to work with. In this kit, you will find a solution called Fazgoo. You will put the required amount of Fazgoo in the provided Petri dish. He smiled. Then comes time for the sacrifice. With the pliers I will provide, you will pull one of your teeth. A gasp rose from the crowd. Chris heard himself gasp too. One of their teeth? Surely he hadn't heard Mr. Little correctly. Oh no. Oh no, Mr. Little is some kind of mad scientist and he's trying to get the DNA or something to make clones... I'm going far with this. I'm going too far with this. Oh no. I, I, I think I can see where the story is going. Excuse me, Mr. Little, could you repeat that part? One student asked in a nervous sounding voice. Teeth, Mr. Little yelled. You will pull one of your teeth. It might hurt a little, but trust me, it will be worth it in the end. Now, are you scientists or are you a bunch of sniveling babies? Scientists, most students yelled back. Good. Mr. Little resumed his... Uh, pacing. So you will pull one of your teeth, as I said, and you will place it in the fazgoo. Then you'll do what scientists spend a great deal of their time doing. You will wait. 
You will be provided with a cot to nap on while the process unfolds. And what process is that? One student asked. Well, what fun would it be if I told you that? All I'll say is that is the process of discovery. Mr. Little's eyes were wild with excitement. You will know when you're done because the results will speak for themselves, literally. Then you will dispose of your creation in a biohazard bag and leave a changed person. And not just dentally, but mentally. He cackled his own joke. That's quite good. That's actually quite good. Uh, and <laughs> many students joined in on that laughter. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like a little kid. Uh, there is a rumour, Dr. Little said, that not participating in the lock-in hurts your performance in my classes. This is not exactly true. If you do not participate in the lock-in, but you successfully complete all course requirements, you will still pass my class, possibly with an above-average grade. However, over the years, I have found that the students who do participate in the lock-in demonstrate a level of commitment that allows them not to just pass, but to excel. And the fact that the lock-ins is worth 500 points of extra credit doesn't hurt either. He grabbed a stack of papers off his desk. Now for all those who are up for this challenge, I will now distribute the required parental permission sheets that allow you to participate in the lock-in. But please make sure you don't say anything to your parents about the required tooth extraction. I don't want to be on the receiving end of any dental bills. Also, as a community of scientists, we must keep our secrets. Chris felt excited, but also scared. He wouldn't let his fear stop him, though. You didn't transform yourself by playing it safe. You had to take risks, try new things. When Dr. Little offered him a permission sheet, he grabbed it. Ha <laughs> uh, <laughs> There was only one part of the lock-in that Chris dreaded. The more he thought about it, the more nervous he became at the prospect of pulling out one of his own teeth. I'm sorry, but uh, I already feel lightheaded. And the reason I feel lightheaded right now is because I really hate reading about teeth or thinking about teeth or anything like that. I'm literally getting dizzy right now as, <laughs> as I think about it. Um, in a minute, I might have to take a break if it gets too intense, but I, I don't think it will. Uh, I think this is the limit of, uh, of teethness. Um, actually, it probably isn't. I underestimate Scott. Uh, Chris had always been squeamish about dental matters like me. Uh, when he was little and had a loose baby tooth, he would procrastinate pulling it until the tooth hung by the smallest of threads. Ugh. Sometimes, if he was lucky, the tooth would just come out without him even having to touch it. He lost one in an apple once, another in an ear of corn. Another time, when he had one tooth that he had been letting hang, that he had been letting hang on for a number of weeks, his dad asked to see it, then yanked it out without warning. Oh God, I hate that. Chris had been mad at him for days. Oh yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> then there was the matter of dental visits. Even if it was an exam and a cleaning, Chris was consumed with anxiety for weeks before. His mother told him she loathed his trips to the dentist as much as he did because she was the one who had to get him up there and put up with his moaning and groaning before, during and after. Chris lay awake all night thinking. The lock-in was two nights away. If he could just figure out a way to participate in the experiment without having to pull out his own tooth. Chris, your friends are at the door, his mum had called. Again, Chris thought. It showed how much less serious uh, Josh and Kyle were that they'd show up and want to hang out on a school night. Tell them I have homework. Chris yelled. Come tell them yourself, his mum yelled back. Chris rolled his eyes but got up from the bed. He went to the door to see Josh and Kyle. Hey, he said, I can't hang out tonight. I've got homework. We just stop by for a sec, Josh said. Kyle's mum is going to drive us all to the mall on Friday. We're going to eat at the food court and see the new Revengers movie. <laughs> oh, that's definitely an Avengers ripoff. <laughs> uh, we wondered if you wanted to come. It was kind of them to ask, but their past time seems so childish now. Thanks, guys. I'd love to, but I've got the science club lock-in at night. Oh, you're doing that, Kyle said, sounding incredulous. It seems kind of sad to spend most of a weekend in school. Well, I think it's exciting, Chris said. Kyle and Josh exchanged a look. Just don't get too deep into the science club stuff, OK? Josh said. Some people in Mrs. Harris's class were talking about it yesterday. They say it's weird, like a cult or something. Chris couldn't help but be offended. Josh and Kyle might not be cut out for science club themselves, but they could at least show it the proper respect. Well, people in science club talk about the people in Mrs. Harris's class too. 
Chris said. Yeah, Kyle said. They say we're dumb. Because they're snobs, Josh added. Kyle gave Chris a strange look. You're not turning into a snob, are you, Chris? No, of course not, Chris said. He hated that word, snob. It was what underachievers called high achievers to make themselves feel better about themselves. Well, he refused to take the, bite, the bait. Do you think Josh and me are dumb? Kyle asked. Chris cringed a little. It's Josh and I, he thought reflexively. And you're not dumb. You just lack maturity and ambition. But he figured it would be a bad idea to say e either of those things out loud. No, of course not, Chris said again. Look, guys, I've got to get back to my homework. Maybe we could do something next Friday, OK? They said sure and OK. But Chris could feel the distance between him and his old friends growing. It was a painful transition, but it was probably for the best. Bye, guys, Chris said and shut the door. In the living room, Chris's mum was leaning over Emma, who was sitting on the couch. Count to three out loud before you do it, OK? Emma said. Before you do what? Chris asked. His mum looked over him. Emma's got a loose tooth. I'm going to pull it for her. Chris felt his stomach lurch. Well, don't do it while I'm in here. You know that stuff grosses me out. Why couldn't his family tend to distaste distasteful matters in private instead of in the middle of the living room? It was just a sign of how re unrefined they were. Mum laughed. Wait till you're a parent. None of the stuff that grossed you out as a kid will bother you anymore. Chris shook his head. I don't know about that. If I have a kid, I'll definitely have to pull out his loose tooth. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris fled the scene of the tooth extraction and went back to his room. As soon as he was alone, his thoughts turned to the science club lock-in. The idea hit him like a jolt of electricity. Loose tooth, of course, that's the answer. Chris had walked past Cool Beans Coffee probably thousands of times, but he had never gone inside. For some reason, it just hadn't felt like it was for him. It was too sophisticated and adult, full of professionally dressed grown-ups sitting with their laptops and cardboard cups. But today, that was going to change. Chris was going inside. He swung the door open and was immediately greeted by the dark, toasty smell of coffee. Paintings by local artists hung from the cafe's red brick walls. Chris had to tell himself not to be nervous, that from now on, this was the kind of place where he belonged. Hi, Chris. San waved at him from where he and Malcolm and Brooke were sitting, their table strewn with open textbooks, notebooks and coffee cups. Get a drink and join us. Great, I will. Chris called back. He studied the menu board over the counter. It was more confusing than anything he'd ever studied in class. There were mochas and frapples and cappuccinos and latte lattes. <laughs> I don't drink any of those drinks, so... Yeah, uh, I'm just making fun of it. There were single shots and double shots and decaf and half-calf. Chris had never taken so much as a sip of coffee before, and he had no idea what any of these words meant. The pretty young women at the counter said, May I help you? Sure, I'm just not a very experienced coffee drinker, so I don't really know what I want. She smiled. How about if I just make you something I think you'll like? Chris was, uh, was relieved to have the responsibility out of his hands. Sure. Do you like chocolate? Of course. I'm not stupid. What kind of weirdo didn't like chocolate? Chris thought. She smiled again. Let's try an iced mocha, then. Give me a couple of minutes. She turned her back on him and poured some different syrups in a machine. Chris couldn't decide if her actions looked more like chemistry or wizardry. Shortly after, she turned with a huge, clear, plastic plastic cup filled with what appeared to be rich chocolate milk topped with whipped cream and chocolate shavings. It looked like the world's fanciest milkshake. The price he quoted was two dollars more than he expected, and he hoped his fr new friends didn't see him having to dig through his pockets and his backpack for change. He took ex his expensive beverage and joined San, Malcolm and Brooke at their table. They were all drinking hot coffee from paper cups, and compared to theirs, his milkshake-like drink looked childish. He had to admit it was delicious though. So it looks like we're going to France this winter break again. Uh, or again, <laughs> Malcolm was saying. I really wanted to do Italy, but my mum can't pass up the shopping in Paris. Oh God, Italy is so... I want to go to Italy so bad. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm, going to be <laughs> I'm going to be bored to tears. I think we're doing a Caribbean cruise this year. I guess it'll be okay, San said. He turned to Chris. We were just talking about family vacations and how we never get any say in where we go. Same here, Chris said. He hoped they didn't ask him about where his family had gone on vacation. Chris's family's vacations were always the same. His parents took a week off in the middle of the summer and they rented a cabin at the state park that was a couple of hours away. 
They spent the week fishing, swimming, hiking, and cooking out. It was always hot and buggy. For the most part, they had fun. But Chris knew it was a poor people's vacation. Ooh, that looks good, Brooke said, nodding toward his drink. Is that a mocha? Yes, said Chris. He was going to have to study up on coffee lingo. His parents drank coffee, but just the kind you bought at the grocery store and made at home. Mine is too, she said. Just hot instead of iced. Chris felt less self-conscious about his drink now. You need to loosen up around your new friends, he ordered himself. They had invited them to join him, uh, or him to join them. They wanted him here. It was time for him to start acting like he belonged. So what kind of results do you think the experiment at the lock-in will produce? San asked, looking around the table. Well, clearly we'll be growing in some kind of tissue, Malcolm said, sipping his coffee. I just don't know what it will do. It will do something, though, that's for sure. Brooke said, hopefully nobody will end up in the emergency room like last year. Chris almost choked on his coffee. Wait, what? Brooke laughed. Some kid didn't follow the instructions right and ended up having a couple of fingers reattached. It was his own fault, though. He ended up transferring to Mrs. Harris's science class, where he was less likely to maim himself. The experiments were always perfectly safe if you don't know if you know what you're doing. But that kid clearly didn't, Malcolm said. Speaking of knowing what we're doing, if we're calling ourselves a study group, we'd better get down to studying. Chris was usually already home when his mum came back from work, but today she beat him there. There you are, she said when he came in. I signed your permission slip for the school thing. I was worried when I didn't see you here. I was just about to call and check on you. She was sitting on the couch with a glass of iced tea, her bare feet propped up on the coffee table. She didn't move, but extended a hand with the paper. I've joined a study group that meets after school, Chris said, pocketing the slip. His mum laughed. If some other kid told me that, I might think he was lying so he could run around after school doing who knows what. But I believe you. I know I'm a nerd, Chris said, sitting beside his mum on the couch. I'm proud you're a nerd, she said, smiling. I was wondering... Chris said, might it be possible for me to have a small increase in my allowance? Mum took her feet off the coffee table and sat up straighter. How much are we talking? Chris tried to calculate a figure that wasn't too outrageous, but still could, would cover the price of expensive coffee drinks at the study group meetings. Ten dollars? Uh, Mum furrowed her brow and made a low whistling sound. And what do you need ten more dollars a week for? It's this study group, actually. We meet at Cool Beans downtown and I need money for coffee. Gotten hooked on the stuff already, his mum uh, said, shaking her head. Listen, kid, those frou-frou coffee drinks are real money suckers. One gal, I work, I, one gal I work with used to buy one every day, and when she quit the stuff, she was amazed at how much money she saved. The fact she was lecturing him was not promising. Why can't you guys study at the library, his mum asked. The library is free. Chris felt a wave of annoyance sweep over him. Mum, I didn't start the study group, I just joined it. Well, maybe you should suggest meeting in the library. I'm sure it would save everybody a lot of money. Chris rolled his eyes. If I suggest that, they'll think I'm poor, which I am compared to them. His mum sighed. If they're your friends, they don't care how much money you have. And you shouldn't care about how much they have either. Mum, Chris said, on the verge of losing his temper. That's not the way the world works. She sighed. I know it's not. I wish it was, though. She looked at Chris with a sad little smile. Okay, I can give you five more bucks a week, but that's all. I'm glad you're making friends who take school seriously. Study hard so you can get rich and support me at my old age. Thanks, Mum, Chris said. This time, he didn't object when she gave him a hug. Chris was buzzing with excitement as he walked to Mr Little's classroom after school on Friday. He knew the lock-in was going to be a transformative experience, probably the most important experience in his life to date. He hoped he could complete the experiment to Mr. Little's satisfaction and gain his approval as well as the approval of the other science club members. Chris wasn't the only student who was excited. As he entered the classroom, he could feel the higher en level of energy. It felt electric. Everybody was talking and laughing. Some people stood and paced instead of sitting at their desks, too restless to sit still. Chris took his unusual seat behind San. San turned around and grinned at him. Your first lock-in. This is a big day for you, right? Yeah, Chris said, smiling back. It is for me too, San said. But it's even bigger for you because it's your first time. After tonight, you'll be a full-fledged member of Science Club. All eyes on me. All mouth closed. Uh, Mr. Little called from the head of the classroom. I know you're excited. Heck, I'm excited too. But there are some very important directions you have to follow exactly, or the experiment won't work. He pushed his glasses on his nose. 
I have also taken the liberty of ordering some pizzas which should be here shortly. Cheers rose from all over the classroom. It's going to be a long night, and you should never conduct scientific research on an empty stomach. But while we wait for sustenance, sustenance, sorry, but while we wait for sustenance, allow me to explain more specifically what you'll be doing tonight. As you can see, I have set up private cubicles for each of you in the lab. In your cubicle, you will find a long table and a cot for napping. On the table, you will find a Freddy Fazbear Mad Scientist kit. There are a few chuckles in the class, and one kid say, but isn't that kid just a toy? It is most definitely not a toy, Mr. Little replied, his voice turning stern suddenly. And if you treat it as one, it will be at your own peril. He held up the kit for everyone to see and then opened it. In the kit, you will find a container of fazgoo in a petri dish like this. He held up a vial of pink glob and a small dish. You will empty the fazgoo into the petri dish. Then comes the sacrifice, the tooth. Chris half whispered. Yes, the tooth, Mr. Little said, grinning wildly. You will use the pliers. Oh, God, I hate the word pliers. You'll use the pliers, he held up a pair of pliers, to extract the tooth of your choice. I would advise one near the back. When your wisdom tooth come in, you won't have to worry about crowding. So I'm finding this so hard to read. <laughs> Chris heard a sharp intake of breath from someone behind him. All of a sudden, his stomach felt queasy at the thought of the tooth extraction. He was glad he had figured out a way around it. 